Schönen guten Abend. Herzlich willkommen im Kosmos und danke an Bruno und Samir, dass wir heute hier sein dürfen. Es freut mich riesig, dass sich so viele Menschen für investigativen Journalismus und damit sicher auch ein bisschen für Public Eye interessieren. Mein Name ist Oliver Klaassen, ich bin Sprecher dieser Nichtregierungsorganisation und wir haben damals für unseren Bestseller über Rohstoffe als das gefährlichste Geschäft der Schweiz vor fünf Jahren einen renommierten Journalismuspreis bekommen. Diese unerwartete Ehre hat nicht nur uns verblüfft, sondern auch viele, viele Medienschaffende. In seiner Laudatio sagte der viel zu früh verstorbene Publizistikprofessor Kurt Imhof damals, dieses, ich zitiere, profund recherchierte Buch erfüllt alle Qualitätskriterien für professionellen Journalismus. Die Reaktionen in der Medienbranche auf die Auszeichnung einer NGO waren damals, gelinde gesagt, geteilt. Wir bekamen zwar viel Applaus, ernteten aber fast ebenso viel Empörung. Heute Abend wollen wir die kontroverse Diskussion um den sogenannten Journaktivismus, wie ich das gerne nenne, weiterführen und vor allen Dingen vertiefen. Und zwar auf einem illustren Podium nachher, hier unter der Leitung von Echo der Zeitmacherin Nicoletta Ciminio. Warum das? Weil investigativ arbeitende NGOs und Medien schon seit jeher zwischen Konkurrenz und Kollaboration schwankten. Und weil dieser sagen wir mal, publizistische Grenzgang fürs breite Publikum, also für Sie, immer intransparenter wird und damit aber zugleich auch relevanter, weil Sie wissen wollen, woher was kommt. Bevor Nicoletta loslegt, präpariert Mark Lee Hunter erstmal die Piste und das wird lustig. And at this moment, I'll switch to English because that's the language which all our panelists speak and understand. And the latter is hopefully true for all these very nice people here at this beautiful venue. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I take it. So Mark is the only person I know to have won awards for both his investigative journalism and his research on investigative journalism. Pretty unique. He has authored more than 200 reports for media like the New York Times, Arte, and Le Figaro, among many others, and published some 10 books, maybe 12 to now. So Mark is what I would call an academic journalist with a keen interest in new forms and business models of watchdog media. And that's hitting it off, talking about those business models of watchdogs. Fortunately, that of Public Eye proved quite successful so far. In any case, last year we could celebrate the 50th birthday of our national organization with its two offices, one which is just across the street here and the other one in Lausanne. On the occasion of this jubilee, we launched our first investigation awards for journalists and other researchers. Right after Mark and just before the panel, the winners of this prize worth some 30,000 Swiss francs will be briefly presenting the results of their investigations. And this for two reasons. Firstly, of course, to celebrate their distinction. And secondly, to provide illustrative material for the following debate. So, Mark, floor is yours. <laughs> Okay. Well, first, I must say I'm amazed to see so many people turning up to talk about investigative journalism. It wasn't always this popular. Second, I'd like to say thanks very much to Oliver for inviting me. Uh, I'm particularly honored to be here at the end of the Jubilee uh, celebration of Public Eye. I think it's incredible that this institution has lasted 50 years and is still moving forward. My particular uh, responsibility tonight is to talk to you about some things that are happening in investigative journalism 
that are bringing us a lot closer to NGOs. I'd like to emphasize that uh, this is something I never expected to see in my lifetime. Uh, my work in investigative journalism began at the end of the 1970s. Our models were Watergate. We were the stars of mainstream media, and it looked like you know the world belonged to us. We had some rude awakenings along the way to the 2000s, but the biggest awakening, I guess, you could call it a slow motion train wreck. Okay, somewhere in the middle of the 1990s, a secular decline began in the audience for mainstream media. By mainstream media, I mean the television stations, the big newspapers, the big radios. They were never dominated by investigative journalism. We were always a tribe a little apart from them. But they put up with us because we brought them prizes, uh, we brought them celebrity, we brought them access to people, a lot of reputation. For some of those who knew what they were doing with it, we even brought them money, sometimes quite a lot of it. But around the 1990s, something happened. The, the industry began to lose its audience. It was very slow at first, and then something came along called broadband internet that started knocking pieces off the audience. And uh, I thought this trend would have bottomed out by now, but it hasn't. These are statistics from uh, the Pew Center. They're for the United States, but I could show you similar statistics for almost any country I know of, certainly in Europe. The main exception that I know of is India, which is still growing fast. But if you look at this, you look at the numbers in brown and the, uh, the arrows pointing down. That's what they lost in the last year. The last year. Okay, and across the, the last two decades, the figures, of course, are more dramatic. Now, what this means is that there was tremendous turmoil in the business models, and there was also, shall we say, a vicious circle, a snake biting its tail, as we say in France, where I've lived for the last 36 years, by the way. Et oui, je parle français aussi. And uh, as the audience went down, uh, business models based on advertising started generating less money and there were cutbacks. Approximately 30% of the journalism workforce was put on the street in the first decade of uh, this century. That is still continuing. Now what this meant was that there were fewer revenues and fewer people paying attention to what was happening in the mainstream media. And then something began to change, okay? As this decline was underway, a lot of new players entered the game. On the right side of the political spectrum, there were people like Christian Radio, which later became Fox News. Actually, that's a historical fact. I didn't make it up. <laughs> and uh, and uh, people like Breitbart, Steve Bannon, who used to be Donald Trump's official advisor, and now seems to be more unofficial, you know, who spent about a decade figuring out how to create an audience for his particular worldview and succeeded quite well at it, created an entire network of similar-minded news operations around Breitbart. If any of you believe that Donald Trump beat the media in 2016, it's not true. One media network beat another media network. And the media network that won was the outright. Can we have the next slide? Okay, now look, there's, there's a lot of information on here, so stay with me just a moment. I'm gonna show you some things that are happening. SDM is stakeholder-driven media. That takes in NGOs. It's people like Greenpeace.org, it's people like Public Eye, Amnesty, Global Witness, and thousands of others. There was an explosion in the number of NGOs over the last 20 years, and thanks to the internet, 
All of them produced their own media. Not all of them produced investigative reporting, but the best and the strongest among them did. And uh, by the way, I spent a certain amount of time training investigative journalists. And in recent years, I've found that when I walk into the offices of someone like Amnesty International in London, about a third of the people in the room are, were formerly at the BBC. They've gone toward the place where they can do the kind of work they always dreamed of doing, which they can't do in downsized news organizations. But in the process, something's changing in, in the way that media are structured, and this is changing the entire industry. It's going to have a big effect on what we look at and where we look at it over the next decades. So let me lead you through this. MSM is mainstream media. SDM is stakeholder-driven media, media that are aimed at stakeholder communities. So the mainstream media give you sports. They give you Brad Pitt's latest marriage. They give you what are, what's being worn this week and where you should wear dinner. Whereas stakeholder-driven media give you the stuff that keeps your community alive. They exist to make your community more prosperous, more powerful, and more permanent. Okay. The ethics are changing in a big way. You know, I, I was trained to think that I was supposed to be objective. In fact, around the age of 35, I became so objective that I disappeared from my own stories and I had my first <laughs> identity crisis. But stakeholder-driven media aren't neutral. There's something they want to accomplish. They tell you what that is. They say, this is what we want and this is how we plan to get it. The time focus of mainstream media is today. It's the news, it's what happened today. But stakeholder-driven media take a different perspective. They look into the past so that they can see the patterns that will enable them to determine the future. It's a long game. Change is slow, as one of my partners at Greenpeace said to me once. And finally, there's the value proposition. Why exactly are you giving any media your attention or your money or your hopes for a better life? And the mainstream media tell you what matters. This is the basis of agenda setting theory. That's what it's called, agenda setting, telling people what matters. But stakeholder driven media don't do that. Because if you're looking at the media, you already know what matters. You don't go to look at greenpeace.org because you want to learn if the environment matters. You go there because you know the environment matters and you'd like to change the outcome. You're looking for some way to participate with a group of other people who are going to change that. Now, at the time we first proposed this model, Myself and my colleagues in the Stakeholder Media Project at INSEAD, I work in a business school, as you can probably tell. Okay. At the time we proposed this model, it seemed pretty radical. That was 2010. This is 2017, and now the New York Times is moving to the right of this chart. They've become an opposition journal to Donald Trump. This was unheard of. This would have been unheard of five years ago, but now it's happening. So, you know, I like to feel smart some days. So I thought, wow, this is pretty clever at the time. And now I realize I completely underestimated the phenomenon. I never thought I'd see the New York Times and the Washington Post moving in this direction. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing more and more NGOs becoming part of the content production, even at these mainstream media. Groups like ProPublica, which is a nonprofit, groups like the Marshall Project, a single subject justice reform nonprofit. And then there are projects that are beginning to be done among investigative journalists and NGOs. And by the way, public eye is still in the forefront on this, okay? There aren't that many people who are doing it. But my guess, since I'm trying to catch up with trends right now instead of predict them, my guess is that this is going to go a lot further very soon. Can we have the next slide? 
Okay. Now, a little bit of history. Okay. Objective journalism is a pretty recent invention. Okay. For most of the history of journalism, uh, media were partisan. They were founded by political parties. They were founded by trade unions. They were founded by activists. Around the 1920s, there was a big movement in the United States to step back from that. Okay. Before that, before that, being partisan was a way to have a certain guaranteed audience. Of course, if you're not partisan, your audience can be much larger. That was one thing that drove toward objectivity. The visible corruption of the news industry was another. And the last one, in my view, was totalitarianism. When people saw what captive media could do to entire populations in the world, they were horrified and they wanted to have journalism that was much more neutral. But what that means is that as we went in this direction of saying that journalism should be neutral, we forgot some pretty interesting uh, examples of what it could be otherwise. Please hit the button because there's an animation here. Okay, this is Albert Londra. He means a lot to me because I live in France and because I think he's great. He was in the 1920s, okay? That was his great period of production. He wrote uh, an investigation of the prison colony. The, uh, the book is called Aubagne, for those in the audience who speak French. He went to the prison colony and he walked around and he saw some things that nobody should ever have to see. And he ended the book, he wrote about that, with a chapter in which he said, I've finished, the government must start. You may have heard a change in my voice, I can't talk about this without emotion. And uh, he laid out four reforms, and he got the reforms. And he got them in coalition with the social movement, a broad movement across France who said, this has to stop. Please hit the button again. This is Lincoln Steffens, who was one of the original muckrakers. That was what people used to call investigative journalists in the United States. He was an ally of the so-called progressive movement, which revolutionized the United States in the beginning of the 20th century. They had a great, though short, ride. It ended after about 10 years when the public decided they couldn't stand learning anymore about what was going wrong. But in that period, they fixed a lot of wrongs. And they did it in coalition with civil society groups. So the only point I want to make here is that the idea that we can only address a general public and that we can't be allies with anyone else and we can't have specific goals as journalists is historically suspect. It didn't always work that way and it doesn't have to work that way. Next slide, please. Okay. Now this is one of my favorite scholars, a guy named David Protess. I read him uh, in the 1990s when he published a book called The Journalism of Outrage. And this was pretty close to Watergate, okay? And the legend I grew up with was that uh, you publish a story and the public is shocked. And the public says naturally, oh, we have to do something about this. And the politicians say, I'll get in front of it and get elected. But that's not how it works very often. I mean, I've, I've, I've tried to make that model work more than once. I published uh, an investigation, as Oliver said, on the front page of the Figaro that won me a very nice prize. But it was 11 years before the problem that we pointed out was solved. 11 years. I could have got hit by a bus. In 2017, I worked on a trans-European investigation with journalists from every country in the European Union. We had no civil society backup. We uncovered a disgusting scandal at the uh, European Parliament. Nothing happened. Head of the Parliament said, oh, we have to look into this. Well, they looked into it just close enough to say, leave it as it is. Okay. And protests said, on the basis of six intense studies into investigations that got a result, that the result came about not only or primarily because the journalists published an incredible story, but because they worked with other civil society groups. 
they made coalitions, and the coalitions stayed in the fight and got a result. Okay, let's have the uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so last year, having all of this in mind, I decided that I should put my mad theories to the test just to see if I should be locked up. And I approached Greenpeace, who I'd been watching for 10 years, and said, we have a project for you. And they said, wow, this sounds like a project we want to do. What we were going to do was take a good look at common agricultural policy subsidies, 40% of the European budget, about a trillion euros a year. That's more than I carry in my pocket. And uh, we would do a project where they would be the publisher of first and last resort. If we couldn't get mainstream media to pick up the story, then they would publish it. And in fact, that's how it worked in France. In most other countries, mainstream media picked it up, as well as having the Greenpeace Network behind it. Now, I'm going to skip, skip around this slide, so bear with me. One of the things Greenpeace brought to the fight was a major audience with whom they have great credibility. They have 3 million donating members, 3 million, 70 million social media followers. So instead of walking into a newspaper audience and saying, well, I know you don't pay much attention to what happens in rural areas, that's how we got the gilet jaune, by the way, okay? Instead of trying to convince them that this was a story that mattered to them, Greenpeace had 73 million people who knew it mattered to them. Okay? We could bring certain things. We knew our story would work. We would tested it. We know how to do stories. We know how to do data. Okay? They had lawyers. We didn't. That was very important. We shared data with them. We shared all the things they would need to defend us if they had to. In one country, we needed them. But most important, right at the bottom of the list was lobbying skills. Because I was tired of throwing stories over the wall and seeing if anybody applauded. I wanted to see what would happen if we were hooked up to a lobbying powerhouse. And we got a result. OK, next slide, please. OK. After the story came out, in part, because of the story and in part because of other stuff, the European Parliament reformed the common agricultural policy. The Committee on Health and the Environment got oversight over cap subsidies. Greenpeace said this was a major victory. I'm very, very happy about it. Now, I'll say one thing, and then I understand my time is up, which is that uh, I took a lot of criticism from some of my journalism colleagues about this project and about the principle of cooperating with an NGO and a very controversial one at that. And, you know, I hope you won't think I'm arrogant, but honestly, I don't care. I didn't get into this business because I wanted to write nice stories. I got into the business because I think the world is a mess and I want to live in a place that's less messy. And, <laughs> well, hell, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So if that means that I can find a partner, an NGO who cares about the same things I do, whose methods I can approve, whose program I can approve, and who's moving in parallel with me, you know, yes. Why not? Why not say to them, give us the seed money. These are the conditions under which we will work. These are the standards we will hold by. If you don't want to do it, don't do the project. They said, yes, we want to do the project, and that's what we'll do. Okay, so for some journalists, this means a threat to their credibility, and it means, it means that they're stepping outside of their role. They're becoming militants. Well, I look back on the history of my profession, and I see a lot of people who said, I'm not doing this to write a nice story. I'm doing this to change something. So I think there will be more and more people. Uh, some of the people who criticized me are already trying to get to know my friends at Greenpeace. <laughs> and I think that as the mainstream media's slow agony continues, there will be a lot more journalists who are thinking hard about how they can do this in an ethical and uh, solid way that respects basic standards of accuracy, probity, and completeness. So thank you very much. 
once again, I'm very happy to be here with Public Eye, which is actually trying to see how this can work as well. I'm pretty sure you would agree that uh, if Mark would just spell out the telephone book, uh, we'd keep on listening. <laughs> but that was uh, a profound and inspiring introduction to a complex and controversial topic. Thank you so much. I mean, you're in an advantage kind of uh, position or in a pole position uh, to your uh, fellow panelists. You're aware of that, so you better let them talk first. <laughs> but that was a powerful introduction, thank you. Now two journalists and an NGO researcher present very briefly their work, which was funded by Public Eye's Investigation Awards. By the way, we're also a very friendly organization, not just Greenpeace, so you can, might come back to us at some point. This award was set up to enable research into human rights violations, environmental offenses, or other irres irresponsible practices of Swiss companies in developing or emerging countries. I cut it short here because we're running out of time, so please now welcome Marie Maurice. First, she's a Lausanne-based reporter who looked into the African business of Swiss tobacco corporations. After You have a microphone? You don't. You get one in just a minute. So uh, after her, Guy Goris, and just right after her, uh, Guy Goris and Nicola Mulinaris will show you how Swiss shipping companies profit in India directly from what is considered to be the most dangerous job in the world. <laughs> Guy is editor-in-chief of the Belgian Mo magazine, while Nicola is a communications director with the uh, also Brussels-based NGO shipbreaking platform. So this is an archetype of collaboration that the discussion will be about later on on the panel. Marie, go ahead. Hi. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Uh, my native language is French, so sorry for my terrible accent. Um, so I wrote uh, the story about uh, tobacco, Swiss tobacco. I had this idea because um, I used to smoke before. I don't know how many people here smoke. A lot of people? Can you... Can you Four? Five? Are you kidding? <laughs> So I've, I've heard for a long time um, about Swiss cigarettes um, and um, that was, uh, there was a, a rumor about it. Uh, I heard that Swiss cigarettes um, were exported to um, other countries and uh, I wanted to check it. Um, but it was um, complicated and I understood um, it... Um, lasted months and months. So I'm a freelance journalist, I'm based in Lausanne, I'm French but I live in, I've been living in Switzerland for 10 years. Uh, Lausanne is very nice, uh, you're welcome if you can, if you can come. And um, I'm a freelance journalist and to speak very concretely, concretely, now medias are paying me, are paying everybody, I mean the price, for uh, an article is 500 francs the day of work, more or less. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. If you do an article easy, um, it could be 300. If it's very complicated, you could have 700. Um, um, so for tobacco, um, it was a problem because 700, I mean, it's good to pay maybe a part of my rent, but not everything. And um, I knew it was a long work. So that's why I applied the price. And 
thanks everybody, thanks the crowdfunding and thanks Public Eye, I got uh, 13,000 francs. It's huge. I mean, uh, um, a Swiss media never, um, I, I'm sure about it, <laughs> uh, nobody in a, in a Swiss media could pay 13,000 francs for a work. So, um, yes, um, <laughs> it was nice, but it, it was not holidays, uh, money. Uh, I mean, um, it was a, a long and hard uh, investigation. Um, the majority of the money was a scientific research because um, my goal was to buy some Swiss cigarettes and to test them to see um, the composition. Um, what what was Swiss cigarette? Um, was it best or worst than the other cigarette, than French cigarettes? And why um, the tobacco industry was exporting many, many, many cigarettes to Africa? Because it's strange, you know, in Switzerland everything is expensive, even work. And you can see in the official figures of the Confederation that Switzerland is, is exporting, is producing uh, tons of cigarettes every year and is exporting the majority to Africa, especially Morocco. So why cigarettes so expensive to produce here are sent to a very poor country where it's sold three francs the box. Um, so that was my, my, my first question, why? The problem was nobody wanted to answer this question. <laughs> the tobacco industry is very secret. At first, at the beginning, I thought maybe I can find some people interested. I I'm, I'm try to write on Twitter, is anybody here who wants to talk about tobacco? And nobody answered. <laughs> Um, so it was very long to meet some people who knew the industry and for them to accept to talk to me of the record, of course, to explain me a bit how is the market, um, what is business in cigarettes and why uh, they are sending a lot of cigarettes to Africa. So I went to Morocco, I bought the cigarettes, I brought them to Switzerland, I gave them to the scientist and um, I bought, I mean, I called some colleagues in Africa, in South Africa, in Senegal, and they bought some Swiss cigarette there, but they couldn't send it to me because it's forbidden to send some African cigarette to Switzerland. So that was such an adventure. And then um, I asked some question to the industry. I thought I was naive. I thought, um, well, I'm in Lausanne. Um, the three major cigarettes producers are based in Switzerland, some in Lausanne. So we are so close, we can talk. They can explain to me. <laughs> All right. And uh, maybe I can visit. Um, some factory, why not? It, it, it could be interesting. So um, they didn't answer the phone. S they only accepted to answer by email. And um, I asked like 70 questions and I had some three, four answers. So it was uh, uh, not enough. So... Um, Yes, uh, that's it. Basically, the, the results, it's, I, I don't want to talk uh, too long, but uh, you can read the, my work. It was very interesting, and I think the time I had, because it lasted four months, I think, in total, the time was precious, because um, the scientific research, they needed at least three months to make the analysis, to have the results of nicotine, um, tar um, and carbon and um, that are the basic um, values in the cigarettes, the, the bad things in cigarettes and so they they worked a lot, um, I worked a lot and we found that 
the um, tobacco, the Swiss cigarettes sent to Africa were m toxic. I mean, more they are more they have more t tar, more nicotine, and more carbon than Swiss cigarettes, because, as you said at the beginning, here um, people don't smoke anymore <laughs> so they have to to find the smoker somewhere and africa is is a perfect place to find the smoker and women and young girls i saw a lot in morocco there uh, the young girls they they said to me yes smoke it's a uh, freedom for us it's modernity and freedom and they are very proud to uh, smoke some swiss cigarettes because they think it's better um it's uh, it's more modern and and the 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 cruel thing is it, that it's not uh, it's uh, it's worst um so i think it's not illegal what I the tobacco industry do but it's a moral uh, problem and uh, i was very shocked and last thing um here in switzerland the law about tobacco is very very thin um, and um, so there is almost no control at all on the cigarettes produced in Switzerland, even for cigarettes you smoke here, you buy. Um, so I think it's a problem. We, we, we have our cantonal chemica. They are making a lot of tests, but they are testing um, rice and pasta and uh, all we can buy in a migro. Uh, but um, cigarettes, no, and uh, because they don't have the time, they don't have the machine to do this. And they said to me, yes, but smokers, they know it's bad to smoke. So, <sighs> so better or not, you know, there's no many difference. So um, I think we need more, more control, and I hope the Swiss government and parliament will read my my article and try to st strengthen th the law and the control on the industry. Thank you very much. <laughs>
a stunning 80 of these 90 belong to the Mediterranean Shipping Company, also known uh, as MSC. I guess you are quite familiar with this name since it's a company that operates um, a large fleet of cruise ships, but is also the second big, biggest uh, container shipping line in the world. If until, I would say, three, four years ago, ship owners were trying to do their best to hide their unethical and often illegal conducts, things are changing now. What you see is that uh, often companies actively promote the use of the beaches for scrapping ships. They promote that backed by certain national governments and by industry association. Now more than ever, the devil is in the, the details. Uh, details that uh, uh, we try to reveal with our investigation. And I think we, we revealed quite successfully. And uh, I leave immediately the floor to my project partner, uh, Guy, who basically experienced personally what is going on uh, on the ship recycling yards, or better, ship breaking yards, located in uh, South Asian beaches. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, and, and it's important that, uh, that we're together on this podium because it was a shared investigation where, uh, as a journalist, I could build on the long history of, uh, of fact collection uh, by the shipbreaking platform, uh, who provided me also access to knowledge, to uh, documents to investigations that were done by universities and all other types of, uh, of knowledge that I needed uh, to underpin my investigation and to focus on the right places. And it's in that way that we saved a lot of time uh, and that we decided to look into the practice of MSC and therefore go to Alang where most of the 80 ships that uh, MSC has, has been breaking the past decade, has, have gone to Alang in India. So that's why I went on that beach and tried to understand what are the current practices there. You read everything in this uh, story, wo schiffen sich zum Sterben verstecken. So that's all there for you. I'm not going to go through all the details. They're there to read. I thought... I try to summarize what did I learn from this investigation. And I'll be brief and quick. One, the importance of transparency. If there's one thing that, that comes out of the uh, investigation, then it is that there's a lack of transparency by the companies about their goals, about the reasons why they go to, sh to beaches, also the, about the economic value that they realize. Um, MSC has not answered. I mean, if uh, Marie had three answers to 70 questions, I had one answer. No, we don't cooperate. Thank you very much. Uh, so that's <clears throat> that it is a problem because to, to judge companies if they're not transparent, but it's the same even for governments. We did uh, and we asked the European Commission to provide us with all the letters that European governments wrote to the European Commissioner concerning the new European rules and regulations for ship recycling. So we got the letters, uh, except for one, the, the, because the government of Cyprus was not, did not agree to provide the letter. The other six letters we got, three of them were from Belgian government, which as a Belgian journalist, of course, is quite interesting to know that our government has been lobbying hardly for to oppose, basically, or to delay or to minimize the regulations. And the lobbying, that was another interesting thing to discover, was mainly done and underpinned by the main person in the administration for toxic waste. So you would expect that administration to fight toxic waste, while in reality it was actually providing the lobby for the shipping industry to avoid their responsibility for the toxic waste that they were sending down to, to Asia. 
So transparency first and foremost, and more of that is needed to come to better regulation and better action. Two, the importance of going places. Um, and I know that a lot of people think that journalists are basically well-paid tourists. Uh, and, and of course, we like to go places. But to go to Alang was essential for this investigation uh, because it's only there that you see what it really means, there that you can speak to the family of a worker that just died by caused by bad labor practices. It's only there that you can go to the office of the ship owner to ask him uh, to explain the accident that just happened. It's there that you can meet the unions that are trying to organize the workers. It's there that you understand that nobody in India gives a shit for the environment. Even though the industry is deeply polluting, it's not high on the agenda. If you don't know that, then you read the reports and you're all outraged but you wouldn't understand why nothing happens in India. So going places, finding the limitations of what you know and what you can do and where you can stand and what you can see, um, get to human stories because even every investigative story, even data-driven stories have a human face and it's through that human face that we as a larger public relate to those stories. Three, the importance of a broader web of knowledge. I already mentioned uh, the shipbreaking platform. There are other NGOs, there are academics working, universities working on that. Um, <clears throat> so it's very important to get all the layers of knowledge together to support the work that you're doing. As a journalist, even if you have three months, which is a whole lot, to do one investigation, you're totally limited because three months is nothing. You don't, I hardly understand the way that the shipping industry works. It's only because people who do know explain it to me and that I can call back to them and say, did I understand this right, that I can provide a reliable story. So I also did an interview with the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxic Waste and he gave an insight from a very different position than the academics, than the NGOs, than the unions, than the owners. And it's the totality of that that provides me with the insight that I need to bring the story. And then there's the importance of independent journalism. And it's something that, uh, that I find important to stress, though it was a very close collaboration between Shipbreaking Platform and Mo Magazine, one of the important and crucial things was that Shipbreaking Platform understood that as a journalist, I had to function and do my work independently. They never interfered in what I was investigating, in, what, in the questions that I asked. I started out with a lot of questions about the position of Shipbreaking Platform, and I made it known. And they still provided me with the support, with the knowledge. Uh, and that's how I came to understand that, to a large degree, they were right. But I want to understand it starting from a critical position and not from accepting that they're the good guys, so they will be right. Because good guys can make big mistakes. And we've seen that with Greenpeace beaching one of their, or allowing one of their former ships to be beached. So it's not because they're good guys that they're always right. And that's uh, a starting position that I need to take. So, and then <clears throat> the importance of funding, of course, but that was eloquently underlined by Marie, so I don't have to repeat that.
Ich glaube, das funktioniert. Ja, genau. Kein Problem. Das gehört zum Service. Ähm, ich heiße Sie herzlich willkommen zu diesem Panel zum Thema zwischen Konkurrenz und Kollaboration zwischen NGOs und, und Medien. Es ist ein, äh, ein Thema, das für viel Gesprächsstoff sorgen wird. Es ist ein kontroverses Thema. Und bevor ich auf Englisch wechsle, stelle ich Ihnen diese Gäste vor des Panels. Sie haben zwei von Ihnen ja soeben kennengelernt. Darum beginne ich jetzt ganz hinten mit Katrin Boss. Sie ist Mitglied des Recherchedesks bei Tamedia. Mark Lee Hunter, den Sie zu Anfang des Abends gehört haben. Silke Grunwald, sie ist Co-Chefredaktorin der Republik. Und Guy Goris, den Sie soeben jetzt gehört haben, der kaum Zeit hatte, sich von, seinem engagierten, von seiner engagierten Ansprache zu erholen und jetzt schon wieder sprechen muss. Und ich bin Nicoletta Cimino vom Echo der Zeit. Ähm, wir werden das Panel auf Englisch führen, aber es gibt im Anschluss die Möglichkeit, Fragen zu stellen und ähm, Fragen Sie auf Deutsch, fragen Sie auf Englisch, fragen Sie, wir werden versuchen, alle Sprachen zu übersetzen, ist kein Problem. Also soll niemand, der jetzt sich nicht getraut, auf Englisch etwas zu fragen, dann sich eben nicht getrauen, sondern fragen Sie einfach so, wie Sie möchten. Okay, also, um, wenn ich Ihnen so zugehört habe, when I listen to you, I listen to you, I listen to you, um, I had the impression, all is fine, we just have to work together, the world will be a better place, we are all going to be merry, um, we are changing the world. Is it that easy? Silke Grunwald, you don't like the word, the word collaboration. Why um, not? May I start with a correction first or better, put better that way, a little advertisement? Um, when we started uh, Republic last year, January, we also kicked off a fund to sponsor, to finance investigative reporting. And that fund is filled with nearly a quarter million Swiss francs. So there is a medium in Switzerland. Um, and this is us, and maybe we're the only ones, I'm not so sure, but I know that we are there. And this is one of our goals is to actually foster investigative journalism. So sorry for the correction, Marie. Um, Yeah, there is, well, there is a limit, which is quarter a million, right? Um, um, but the rules are there. Um, and of course, that has happened before. We did sponsor larger projects of that size before because we know that we need to um, support freelance journalists. Otherwise, we won't get those stories out there. Um, in French, in English, in Italian. You can um, apply, you Marie, can't, we, we can't, for your even, next story. We even did a romance piece. Remember the, um, the cartel story we did. So th that for the little advertisement. We are there, and this is, our, really, this is one of our goals, to foster investigative reporting. Um, when it comes to collaboration, um, I'm very happy when it's with collaborations between any sort of journalism and any other th sort of organization, as long as the sender is clear and transparent about mm -hmm. it. And what we haven't spoken about now is um, the one in the gray zone, the collaboration in the gray zone, where an NGO, for example, Public Eye, tips off a medium, and that medium publishes a story, but doesn't make clear where the information is coming from. And that is a part of the collaboration business that I'm not too fond of. So you mean that the media is covering the story without telling where yes. they have the information Yes. From? And there, is a, and there is a prominent example, um, whilst I was working for the public broadcaster about um, army boots um, for the Swiss army being produced in Romania. And that, is, that story was done or run by SAF Rundschau. And from my point of view, it wasn't made clear that it goes back to an investigation that the uh, Clean Clothes campaign did. Clean Clothes campaign, um, Public Eye did, I think, co-found in the 90s, the Swiss chapter of CCC, and it was not made clear when airing the story that this was initiated, this research or this investigation was initiated by an NGO. Mark, you raised some eyebrow. <laughs> Why is that? Fantastic. Well, for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, Okay, as I said, I work in a business school. A lot of my work has been paid for in business schools in the last few years. Thanks, INSEAD. Okay, 
the, uh, the point I wanted to make is this. What you're describing is not a collaboration. They treated you like a supplier. They treated you like someone who had something they wanted, okay? And, you know, I'm very aware of the problem you're talking about, okay? I don't think that's going to hold up too much longer because NGOs are developing their own audiences. And I can tell you one thing, okay, in our research at INSEAD, we found out, we found several major, major corporate crises that were decided not by the mainstream media because the mainstream media never covered them. But NGOs and stakeholder-driven media humbled those companies brutally, okay? So one of the things we're seeing happen now is the development of alternative pathways. And those pathways are changing the power equation between mainstream media and civil society organizations. Let's just ask Catherine, you work for the investigative... I, I'm from the mainstream media. Yes. So <laughs> I'm in this very comfortable situation here to be the, the only one. Um, and I have to disagree with you, some at least, because I'm, Good. I'm, I'm from, I'm from Tamedia, um, and I have to say we are an investigative journalist team of 12 people. Um, we have been investigating the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, the implant files. And I'm don't, I don't want to brag here about this. I just want to say investigative journalism doesn't just happen outside of the mainstream media. No, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. Okay, okay, but that's a little bit how it sounds. And what I like to say is that I think it's not this is better than that. I really think it needs both. Mm. I'm absolutely happy that, I mean, my media house is still financing us. I don't know how long they will do it, uh, but um, I, I think it's important that we have both. I mean, the public eye, Greenpeace, the work they do, uh, Republic, um, is very important. But what the mainstream media, as long as they finance it, I think it's great. And um, just to add a little thing, uh, you, you talk about a broad audience. Our response to having a broad audience is that we have international cooperation of medias. You know, with with the Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, we have, we work together with whatever New York Times, Süddeutsche Zeitung, and that's how, or medias in Africa and in India, everywhere, and this cooperation brings us really broad audience, and it really helps us. And this is our answer of this helps us um, having investigations. What you said actually is that we broaden our network of knowledge. We do that by cooperation amongst the journalists. You think we should do it with together with um, with uh, NGOs and and there are some. I have some problems with that. It's yeah. not. I don't say no, but I have some problems that we can discuss tonight. But the thing that Silke said that a media is reporting on something and pretends it has done the work, but the work has been done by an NGO. Does this happen at Tomedia? Yeah, um, not with me. I mm -hmm. think what we would do is if, like if, a, if an NGO comes and says, I have this story, uh, it's very important. And I would say, yeah, this is important and interesting. But then I would have to see the documents. I would have to see the documents. I have to be able to analyze it. And then I would um, quote the NGO. You know, I would use the end use, in quotes, quotation mark, as an expert. And I would have this NGO in the text as an expert. Like a source. As a source mm -hmm. and expert, yes. But the Otherwise, correct answer it's not yes. honest. Yeah, but the correct answer is yes, it did happen yeah. before as well with at Time Media. I can't talk for, for, for Tom Media, really. I can only talk for my team and us. And I, I, no, we, I think we would always quote and have the NGO in a text when we get information from an NGO. Keith? Well, I, I think... <coughs> It's, it's only part of the problem, uh, this quoting or not quoting or being transparent. I think we, we have to be transparent, but not only when it comes from an NGO. Are we transparent when companies provide information and everybody reproduces it? How much of the... There's, there's, in Belgium, I know that there's zero budget almost for all the tourism information. It's all paid for by the tourist companies. 
They fly journalists places, they lodge them in hotels, they bring them to the, to the sites, and it's never published as such. So I it's not just a matter of being transparent when information comes from NGOs, it's a matter of being transparent in journalism across the line, whether it comes from government, and we often don't quote them, from companies, we hardly ever quote them, or give clearly the, the source, or from academia, which we also, then we, what you often see is that the quote comes at the end of the article, uh, then the academic source is quoted as if we asked to react to something that we bring. So I think journalism has a lot to work on in terms of transparency of its sources, but much larger than the subject of tonight. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I'd just like to say, you know, I'm not saying people have to do this or that or the other thing. I'm saying we can do this or that or the other thing. I'm very happy to hear about your unit, but, you know, and I'm also very happy that in the last couple of years in the United States following the election of Donald Trump and here and there and other places, you know, we're starting to see mainstream media come back into the investigative game. But the reason we're discussing these phenomena tonight, and you know this very well, I don't know how hard you had to fight to get your unit established and fun funded, but I'm sure it was not a day at the beach. Okay. Okay. How, how did that go? <laughs> Maybe you can talk about that later. Actually, yeah. Um, but just, just to say, okay, yeah. it's great that the mainstream media are getting back in the game there. But the reason this space opened up, and the reason we're having this conversation tonight, is because they needed competition. In the absence of competition, a lot of people were pulling out of the game. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's, doesn't it work? It doesn't Maybe work. you can borrow. Actually, I have to say, it wasn't really a, such a hard fight for us. Because um, it was, I mean, we always had this idea, we always had this dream that we could do that one day, that we could spend, like Mario was talking, three months, four months investigating something. That's wonderful. It's a big privilege. I really am very humble about it. I know this is, this is something uh, that we need to be... Um, that we need to see as a privilege. But it actually was that mainstream media, or I have to say to media, realized that they have an image problem. This is my opinion. I'm not talking for my um, CEO. I'm, I think that was the main reason. They realized they have an image problem, or they, they need to invest money into uh, investigative journalism because that, that is an asset. Nowadays, this is an asset, for, uh, for even, even for mainstream media, for the Süddeutsche Zeitung, for the New York Times, Washington Post, and even for the little Tom Media in Switzerland, it is an asset to say we have an investigative team, we, have, we win prizes, international prizes, with Panama Papers, whatever, and I think that's why they did it. It was not, we didn't really have to fight that hard. They really wanted it because they saw, as you showed it to us, that the, the, the numbers go down. They need readers, more readers, and they're trying to do it with, with uh, stories about I don't know, cats and dogs, but also uh, about investigative journalism. And they're trying, and all we can hope is that actually this, this works. Well, we talk a lot about bias. We say NGOs provide information, but they're biased. But isn't everybody somehow biased who gives information to journalists? I mean, a politician is biased. He's never giving information just because, or yeah. No, I think... <coughs> Yes, everybody's biased, but that's, that's such a broad statement that it doesn't lead you anywhere. Uh, are NGOs biased? <clears throat> yes, and that's why they exist, because they have a goal, they have a mission, they want to change something. And they're quite open and obvious about it, mm. so that makes it quite easy to work with, I find. Uh, I have to qualify that. I have worked, um, my, my news platform, which is a magazine and a website, is, uh, is founded by NGOs. Um, and so I learned from day one to make a distinction between their mission and our mission. And as media, 
<clears throat> I'm not sure that I fully uh, am on the same page as Mark when he says I'm, I'm in this to change the world. Yes, I've, I, I would love to change the world. But I think that journalism is bringing something else to the table than NGOs. Uh, not that journalism is objective, but it has a different deontology and it has to be critical even with the solution that you sympathize with. <clears throat> and that's a hard sell to NGOs who have a campaigning logic and you can, you can destroy that by showing that some of their presumptions are limited, wrong, or, or counterproductive. Uh, but that's, I think, what you bring to the table. Uh, and that can be, in the short run, dif difficult. But my experience is, after working uh, in Mo for 16 years now, that in the long run, everybody understands that that's your role, and that's why they fund us to play that role. So just that maybe not everybody knows Mo. Mo is your magazine uh, that everybody has... Everybody knows Mo. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mo is a magazine that has, as you said before, has been founding, founded by NGOs, yeah. but also the Belgian well, state. Yeah, it's very briefly. We're, we're, yes, we have it's, a quite, it's an interesting model, a quite that's why. Uh, particular model. <clears throat> so we're founded by NGOs that also contribute to our financing. We're subsidized by the Belgian and the Flemish governments uh, from their uh, development cooperation budget. We're distributed as a magazine by the main uh, commercial magazine in Belgium that carry us to all their subscribers uh, without us costing uh, the distribution. We pay the printing and everything, but not the distribution. And then we have some uh, income from our some subscriptions, but most of our the, the magazine is is distributed ninety five thousand copies, <clears throat> only five thousand. Uh, subscribers, 90,000 go to that commercial magazine subscribers. So we have limited own commercial income, but this is the square that we operate in. How easy was it for you to put the limits? How, how I mean, you're not going to tell, yeah, they put me under pressure, the NGOs put me under pressure, but was I would it? if they did. Okay. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm quite obnoxious about that. I mm -hmm. don't want pressure. And, and, of course, being the editor of it for 16 years consecutively gives you a position of uh, negotiation. But from day one, there was the NGOs requested a clear reduction, uh, how do you say that, statute? Uh, it's, a, it's an agreement between the founders, the owners, and the reduction that there was a clear delineation and reduction autonomy and everything was put on paper from mm. day one. And then, of course, day two comes and, and somebody is unhappy about what we write or what we don't write because they're campaigning on it and we don't write about it. So I get phone calls. Okay. But that's part of the game. I mean... An editor-in-chief who doesn't get phone calls <laughs> probably has a bigger problem than somebody who gets the phone calls. The question is not, are you called? The question is, do you have a position to answer? And I have always been in that position to say, listen, we've looked at it, or sometimes I have to say, we just bloody forgot. And I confess. <laughs> <clears throat> That's not received well, but okay. I do confess if, if that's true. But it's, it's worked. And actually, I find the cooperation could go much beyond. Now the cooperation is basically, they, they finance us, they support us, but they give us not enough information. I keep telling them, and there's now 12 NGOs in our uh, association, I keep telling them, you're sitting on all this information. They're, they're present in, not only in Congo, but in, in tons of countries. Why don't you give us what you know, what mm. you see? And then we can work from that. But they're reluctant. Silke, he said an editor-in-chief that doesn't get phone calls does something wrong. Now we know that Republic is also looking for money. If you get a yes. phone call from a 
big NGO that says, look, we're going to pay some big money. Would you take it? Well, I'm only three months in the business of being an editor-in-chief, <laughs> and I can tell you, we get I got phone calls. I was I, I was surprised that I do that they did get my number, um, and and anyways, they, yeah, as you say, you get calls, and if you don't, I guess you're right, you do something wrong. Um, we have a we have a business model that is based on subscriptions, um, and this is what we're holding on to. We want the individual subscriber. Um, and yes, there is the possibility to donate money, um, but there is a clear Chinese wall between the fundraising and the editorial team. Um, that doesn't mean that I do not give information or share contacts. I did do that because I was head of journalism or the board of Journalism Fund, another funding um, journalism funding organization, and I did share my contacts with that team that is responsible for fundraising at Republic. But I'm not the one doing the calls. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that is with my co-editor-in-chief responsible for the editorial content. And the calls that I get, those are the ones from people um, or from people and organizations who want to push or retract or stop a story. How many times do you get contacted by an NGO and offer the story? It did happen before, and that the funny thing is you see those stories then wandering around, and then finally they hopefully, or finally they found a place where they then get published, and that happened before that I got contacted to, to run a story, or whether I would be interested to run a story, and we declined for the very simple reason, we didn't have the capacities to verify the story, because we would have needed to travel to that to place, go places. as you described it beforehand. You need to be on site. We just cannot take that story and push it out there. This is not how we understand our craft of doing journalism. So we happily declined. Um, another contact, of, um, another colleague of mine was contacted, I think, two days later um, by that same person, asking whether he would be interested to run the story. The colleague came luckily he came back to me immediately and I think it was around Christmas, New Year's Eve we found the story on Spiegel Online um, and having checked who the reporter was, the reporter was not on site. That is not the way we perceive our craft of doing journalism. I have a colleague working in the NGO who, <coughs> who told me, sinngemäß, not with these words but more or less um, journalists haven't assimilated yet the idea that it doesn't work anymore without us. So journalism needs NGOs to get the stories. And, and Swiss journalists are like, they have some kind of arrogance thinking that um, they can do the job without NGOs. No, we share one common thing. Investigators within an NGO or investigators, freelance investigators working for an NGO or full-time employed investigators, in which that is the craft of investigating, doing, collecting data, for example, doing the data analysis. They, all those working steps, we have them in common, and I'm very much um, profound of the idea to share our, um, our experiences, to learn from each other. Um, I did, uh, I did teach with a colleague of mine who is now with, a, uh, with another NGO. Um, she used to be with me on an editorial team, not anymore. But what we do, we teach the technique of investigative reporting. Um, that we do have in common. But we do have a different position, a different stance, and a different role to fulfill. Could I just add very briefly, uh, we, we got contacted by an NGO a couple of years ago uh, that does financial transparency in Belgium. And they came to us and they said, listen, we're working on an investigation about what Belgian banks do uh, with their money in connection with, uh, with arm mm -hmm. uh, trade. Yeah. And would you be interested to, <laughs> to work on that? So we made an agreement with them. They did three months of investigation. And then they gave us all of what they found, uh, and, and, and not just the end result, but, but the investigation. And they allowed us two months to work on it from our journalistic point of view, to write the story, to double check, to, to talk to people. And then we set the date of publication. So 
the, that morning, the magazine came out with the story that we built on their investigation, and it was clearly mentioned. And that morning, also at 10 o'clock, they did their press conference, uh, bringing their their uh, um, advocacy and their solutions and their proposals, um, which were mentioned in the article, but but as a sidebar. Uh, so we brought the information as we double checked it, and they used the visibility of, uh, of what we did to bring their proposals to a broader public. So there was a win-win situation which was clear to everybody. Transparent? Uh, I think uh, we were very transparent that because it, it was mentioned how we did and how we, we worked. But it's, it's, a, it's an example of not just sharing methods, but even sharing content, which, which is rare. But I think there are more possibilities if more NGOs, what Mark thinks is happening, and to a certain extent you see it internationally, that more NGOs are developing into investigations themselves uh, and, and thus hold material that could be interesting for us if we get it in time and if we, get, if we can work on it from our own position, which is what we did for our investigation as well. I want to return to the point you made earlier about bias, okay, that working for uh, an NGO induces bias. This is what I hear from my colleagues in investigative teams, okay, I'm very active in the, in the investigative journalism network, so, you know, I hear this a lot. And I think the issue is real, there's a problem, but I also think that it's because people don't spend enough time developing relationships Often, it's because people don't spend enough time developing relationships, expectations, and transparent working procedures. You know, before I worked with Greenpeace, I watched them for 10 years. I knew who, exactly who I was dealing with. I knew what their goals were. I had a pretty good idea of how they worked from the outside. I learned a lot more when we work with them. Okay, collaborating with an organization like that is not always a day at the beach, hmm. but it's a lot easier if you're in constant communication, and if you set the expectations very clearly at the start. We had a contract that said, we publish what we find, okay? At one point, they asked us to do something. We looked at it, and we said, we can't get the data to do this. This is what we have the data to do. You know, and some people were not particularly happy about that, but, you know, the project went forward. We published it on time. We got a result. So, you know, I mean, everybody is at an experimental phase right now. Besides the, the things that are happening here, or the project I did with Greenpeace, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project is working with Transparency International. What I've seen in every project is that there's a different operating mode, okay? People are working it out as they go along. Okay, now we published our operating mode. We put out there how we did this, how we organized it, and you know, we're gonna do that on every project because the game book is still developing. Okay, this hasn't been tried in the way we're all trying it now before. That's, to me, that's exciting, but I don't wanna be scared away from it by someone saying to me, you know, oh my God, you know, you're gonna be dealing with these biased people who'll tell you what you can or can't do. Well, you know, if somebody does that, I say, okay, I walk. Mm. You use a lot the term stakeholder-driven media. Yeah. Did I quote that right? Yes. And you said that um, if you work for stakeholder-driven media, yes. you don't want to just say what the problem is, but what they can do about it. But this is part of a larger movement that's happening in journalism worldwide. It's called constructive journalism or solutions journalism. And personally, you know, I mean, I heard the guy who created the term constructive journalism talking about it 10 years ago, and it was like a bell went off in my mm. head. I thought, this is what I always wanted. You know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do journalism, and you have to decide what's important to you because the work is so hard that if you're not really engaged in it, you're not going to get it done. That doesn't mean that everybody has to have the same motivations as me, 
But it, it does mean that if you're not working with people whose goals resonate with yours, you shouldn't be in that game. Where I wanted to go is that if you, you said that you have a community, yes. and I was asking myself if that doesn't create bubbles. You know, we're always talking about bubbles. People who are interested in a theme, so they want to know more about it, so they're interested, they're some, they have some kind of expertise, you know, they, they know what they're reading about, they're not new to it, but nobody that isn't maybe, sometimes you read something and you, and you learn something new. Sure, but one doesn't exclude the other, okay? Um, I mean, it's a question of the scale and scope of what you're engaged in. There are subjects that touch everybody, like the Panama Papers. There are subjects that more people should be thinking about, like rural poverty, uh, you know, rural undevelopment, you know, the ways that their tax funds go out, but that aren't being covered. You know, um, you know, to me, this is part of the marketing of a story. And I don't want to go overboard on the business school aspect, okay? I was a full-time freelance investigative journalist for 25 years, and I still do investigations in the academic realm. I'm an investigator. That's how I define myself. But, you know, we don't think enough about reaching the people who need to know what we have to say. Mm. And NGOs are better at that than us. And this is one thing we can learn from them. You know, rather than saying to them, oh, you're stuck in a silo, we might say to ourselves, geez, that's a big silo. How did they build that? Uh, Catherine. Um, I would like to answer to this, maybe to the bias um, that you mentioned and then what you said. Um, yes, they are biased, but um, we are not objective either. But the problem is that I have, like to, to co uh, collaborate with um, NGOs, is that with the fake news situation that we have now, the medias, I think, I mean, we always had to, but more than ever, we really have to be sure we show our independence. And, I, and this is maybe more personal or emotional. I just would have a problem to really co collaborate with an NGO, um, knowing that they on a, they're campaigning, that's that's what they do, and I think they do it very well, and it's very important that they do that. But this is not my job. This is I, I have another job, and if I want to be, and I know you don't like that, but I still I have to say it. If no, but I want to be, it's not my job either. That's why they're my partner. It is their job. I it's know. It's not my job. Still, still, I want to. I, I don't know. I just would feel uncomfortable. I I I would really like to work with them, if you want to call it, and see them as experts. When I do my investigation in something that they have a lot of knowledge, I need them as experts. But I didn't. I wouldn't want to have them as my partner. This seems more important than ever for me because I want to be sure that the readers see us as independent. This is important. Maybe. There will always be some that don't believe us, but we will do everything we can to to show that. That's important. Um, yeah, and Some kind of ambition of pureness, pureness of journalism. I don't know if it's pureness. It's just I mean I just do the best I can. We all do the best we can. We just do everything we can to show that we are looking things at different sides. And I feel like if I go into an investigation and I have a partner that has a clear campaign goal in a way, and this is maybe being a little unfair to NGOs, I'm maybe exaggerating, but they do have campaign goals, then um, to build that the audience would believe me that I looked at it from all different sides, I don't know. I would feel uncomfortable. I would have a hard time to really make this believable. Mm. And the other thing when you say they have a huge silo, it's true. But isn't it not preaching to the choir? Isn't it not? I want to reach the people that don't know. I, you say um, people go to the website of Greenpeace because they already think we need to protect the environment and they need to, they want to see how we do it. This is super important. But my job is another one. My job is to find these people uh, that don't know people that don't know what, what happens in offshore countries, what happens with rich people bringing their money over there, or, or have an implant in their body that is 
killing them and they didn't know about it. I want to reach these people and not the ones that have already been engaged in these issues since years and have paid their, the, the, the money to an NGO. Well, I agree, but allow me to point something out. When you say that you want to reach people who have an implant in their body and don't know that it's killing them, you are talking about a stakeholder community. Okay, the people who are most directly touched by the story. So, you know, to me, I didn't think of the public for this story, the potential public, as people who are Greenpeace members. I saw that as a core audience we could build on. But the larger target is people like me who are not Greenpeace members, but who have watched the degradation of rural Europe. You know, as we were planning this project, I mean, I do other things too, but I had a student from Georgia who said, we have 200 abandoned villages in Georgia. It sent a chill down my spine. My village is becoming abandoned. You know, and, it, it, you know, to me, the, the audience for this story ultimately, and such stories have long legs. You know, all investigations have very long legs if you hit something that's real, okay? The, the ultimate audience is people who will not accept that we sacrifice the European countryside. That was, that, that was for me. But, you know, I accept that one of the steps along the way was to try and get a concrete result. And, you know, I always found this to be a, con a contradiction for investigative journalism. I've won a couple of IRE awards. On the IRE award, application, you're supposed to say, what result did you get? So on the one hand, we're saying, well, we did this because it had to be said and people didn't know it. And on the other hand, we're saying, oh, by accident, something happened. Well, no, it doesn't happen by accident. Okay, and, and by the way, I've talked with Gerard Ryle about this at, uh, at uh, ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which did the Panama Papers. and. You know, uh, I wrote something about them, and I said they were supported by a bunch of stakeholder groups. That's one of the reasons they succeeded. I sent it to Gerard and said, is this true? And he wrote back and said, yes, that's true. <laughs> so, you know, one doesn't exclude the other. Uh, the arsenal worst. is getting bigger. Exactly. Just, just yeah. a little note. There, uh, ICIJ also did Swiss leaks, because huh? uh, <clears throat> might be important to mentioned that in Switzerland, that it was not just Paradise Papers or Panama Papers, but Swiss Leaks was one of the major projects of the ICIJ as well. And your team. Well, what, I don't understand what you mean with that now. No, no. Yeah, they did a lot. I mean, there yeah. is a lot of leaks. Uh, That's, uh, I'm just, uh, it's what not to you, it's for the public. Because uh -huh. we're in Switzerland, so Swiss Leaks has been an important investigation. Yeah, Switzerland is always important when it's about leaks with offshore. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's actually why we are in ICIJ, because they like us. Because whenever there's a leak, <laughs> Switzerland is very important because all the banks and the lawyers and, and who's not is involved. And but so it needs people that. here in the country that help. When it comes to financial flows, Switzerland is probably number one. That's for sure. But um, I'd like to touch back that on that point that you mentioned, G, before, and, 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 and pose a question. Why should I make a difference between an NGO lobbying, for example, for clean clothes, and an NGO, or not an NGO, but another lobby organization um, who is providing intelligence on the pharmaceutical industry? Um, you said that in the very beginning, and I agree on that, that we shouldn't, and I'm not doing a difference between those two groups of organizations. And from the, from the discussion that we're having now, it sounds like, you know, there is the good, there are the good, the good lobbying, guys. the good guys, the good lobbying organizations, and we account public eye, of course, to, to them, we, we account, um, we can count credibility to Greenpeace, to Global Witness, so on and so forth. In my practical work as an now editor in chief, but beforehand as a reporter, I didn't make a difference whether a mm. person from Inter Pharma contacted me or a person from Public Eye or from well, Credit Suisse I, or I, any I, other or any other company mm. um, that provided information, not including the tourism organization, because mm. I never did did that kind of journalism. No, I I I am. Um, <coughs> 
I take the point. <laughs> um, and, and in terms of, of source, you're absolutely right. That's how we treat them as well. We're, we're debating a deeper uh, form of collaboration. That's the question. Can we work with them on, on certain projects? And I'm probably or might be more political. So for me, it, it is a difference whether a, a lobby group for big capitalist organizations try to convince me of their truth uh, and, and, and would propose like the EXA, for instance, uh, in my field now, uh, the European Shipping uh, Association uh, invited me to join them on a fact-finding trip to Alang, uh, to the shipping shipbreaking yards that I just wrote about. Well, I'm very reluctant to do that because I know what their that what their agenda is, and I know that given the context, I will not be able to escape that agenda. Uh, they're going on with 30 people to India for three days with a one-day trip to the to the beaches. Well, I'm not willing to be part of that PR uh, effort. Would I join shipbreaking platform if they would ask me to go with them? I might consider it, but not for a one day trip. I would then debate and say, okay, you have one day, you, I'll, I'll go with you, but I'll stay behind and do another extra week or something, and you provide me with, with some... For me, the, the basic... Uh, distinction is political. And, and so organizations that have a commitment to make the world a better place would be, for me, organizations that I want to consider collaborating with on clear terms. <clears throat> I don't feel, and I'm, I'm a small uh, setup, I don't feel that I'm in a position to counterbalance the big capitalist lobby groups. Guy, so, are you an activist? I used to be. I don't have time for activism. <laughs> no, I, it's true. <laughs> I'm, I'm working 70 hours a, a week, at least, on my job, so I don't have time. So my contribution to the larger field of, of making the world a better place is making sure that the world gets better information. That's my okay. contribution. But so, if you want to make the world a better place, you're an activist. No, I, I mean, I would still hope that everybody wants to make the world a better place. There's just a, a, there's a whole lobby of commercial interests that are more interested to make maximum profits than the impact it has on the world. I don't want to cooperate with that side of humanity. Uh, not because they don't know things, but I'll try to know what they know without cooperating with them. It's not my tribe. So I feel more at comfort with activists, although I distrust to a large extent the activism when it enters my space. Uh, so I, I, keep it, no, I keep it at arm's length. Yeah. We cooperate when possible, but on my terms and 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 that i but well, if you say but if you say can, that you just want you, i mean if you say um i want to watch one side of the story but the other side doesn't interest me that no, no, much i didn't say that okay <laughs> no it's 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 a it's a deep distinction uh, we're talking about collaboration huh yes <clears throat> I will not collaborate with the pharma industry lobby. But would you take information from them? Of course. For your I mean, magazine. I, I told you we need to get a broader network of knowledge. <clears throat> knowledge is everywhere. And, and there's biases everywhere, even in academia. So you sift through and you double check and you lay the information in different layers and then you see the patterns and, and it doesn't mean that only the congruent information is true because the outliers might be the ones that have seen something that all the others didn't see or tried to hide. So you, there's a lot of work to understand those layers 
of, uh, of knowledge. But <clears throat> when, you, when we talk about collaboration, there's, there's a political position, in a sense. And we take our, we're currently debating our values. And <clears throat> universal human rights is one of the values that drives our journalism. The belief that the world should be a just place for everybody is one of the beliefs that drives our journalism. Journalism is not neutral. It speaks truth to power, and it gives dignity to those who are exploited. That's basic journalism, and it's not neutral. Catherine. Um, I, I I just wanted to disagree a little bit with what you said, that it doesn't matter if the f a pharmaceutical or the NGO comes to you. For me, it does actually make a little difference um, because we talked about the network, network of contacts we have. And um, some NGOs, I have contacts, they are extreme experts in things that I just no, I'm not knowledgeable enough and I really need their, uh, their knowledge. And so we know each other, we, you know, people know each other and trust, it's a matter of trust too. And you know, we, there's years of, of discussions of working together, of analyzing documents, whatever, and trust builds up. So this is, makes for me a big difference to somebody that I either don't know or I can see their um, intention right mm. behind their ears. You know, it's just obvious what they want from me. Uh, and I know you could say now the NGOs want the same. They just want in, 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 you know, use you as an instrument. But I think that's where networks are important and, and that we, we know each other for a long time and, and can distinguish a little bit between. You worked with Greenpeace yeah. for a, a lot of time very intensely. It was that investigation took three months and there were 15 people involved on our side. Now, do you think that if now that the work is finished with Greenpeace, if you get to know or if you if someone gives you information about Greenpeace, that is, mm, and do you think that you are able to like put a line and say, OK, yes, if I have to investigate about Greenpeace, something that went wrong, wrong in, with Greenpeace, I'm able to do it, even if you worked so closely with them? I don't know, you know, if I felt that if I felt that Greenpeace was becoming an evil organization, which I can hardly imagine. Not evil, but maybe they did something I but mean, maybe we they all made make a mistake, mistakes, you're saying. yeah. I don't know, you know, one of my idols and friends in the profession is a guy named Andrew Jennings. Mm -hmm. Okay? Who he's the guy who brought down FIFA. I guess everybody in Switzerland knows about that. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. So Andrew said, Andrew said something once uh, that, you know, gets back to what you were just saying. He said, uh, he said who are you going to go after, the guy in the Mercedes or the guy on the bicycle? You know? I mean, I don't know. You know, there, there are people who do a lot of damage on a major scale. If I felt that I could no longer work with Greenpeace or with anyone else for that matter, you know, I would, I would just let the relationship slip, you know, and I would look for, for someone who, who behaved at a higher standard. But, you know, the question is not quite that simple, okay, because in large organizations, okay, there are people who are amazing people on a human level as well as on a personal level, you know, and on a professional level, who have the highest standards and integrity, and you find them anywhere. Okay, Seymour Hirsch built his career as an investigator of the CIA on such people. Okay, not everybody in the CIA meets those standards. He found the ones who did. Okay, and, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are people at Greenpeace whom, whom, you know, I don't have a severe judgment of, but they're not the people I'd naturally collaborate with. Mm. Okay, there, there are different people in different places and you you know you have to have a standard of character yes but my as question well was as information in german you say um, wenn du dich mit jemandem ins bett legst once you have put yourself to bed with someone like you have worked very closely with someone if then you can make you know, le pas à and, and look at it from a distance and be critical. But collaboration well, you never is bite the hand that feeds you, I know. Right? You never <laughs> bite the Wait hand that feeds you. Okay, let me address here a very specific point. You asked her if an NGO came and offered you buckets of money, 
Well, I'd like everyone here to know 13,000 Swiss francs is not buckets of money. Greenpeace gave me 23,000 euros, of which 4,000 went to French taxes the day I was paid. Okay, and I had a team of 15 people of whom I was paying, I don't know, six, seven, you know? That's not buckets of money. And by the way, the idea that I could be corrupted from that is, by that is like, you know, I mean, I don't know. Well, it's true. The problem with journalists isn't that you can buy them, it's that you can buy them so cheaply. <laughs> yeah. But. Let's see. That's Question. the rather but sad part. No, just yeah. very briefly, <laughs> because you're referring to Greenpeace, because I was working with the NGO on this project on shipbreaking, I got to know as the first journalist that Greenpeace made a major mistake. With the ship. With the ship in Bangladesh. Yes. Did and they admit it, by the way? They did. Well, that's Greenpeace. They admit their mistakes. <coughs> and, but it was on their website for a month. Nobody took it. And, and published it. So I, because I was working on it with the NGOs, I knew about it, and, and I decided, well, I have to bring this to the larger story. Uh, basically, because it is news. It's not because I like Greenpeace, probably. I don't know them as closely, but I sympathize. But if they make a mistake, then that should be publicized. If only because of the same reason why we publicize other mistakes mm. to make people better their behave, yeah. how they behave. Yeah. And so Greenpeace needs that too, as every human organization needs yeah. it. I'll Let say this, when I was doing my due diligence on Greenpeace, you know, due diligence, where you see who am I dealing with, what have they got in their closet, you know, what don't they have in their closet. One of the things that I noticed was that time, from time to time they admit their mistakes. I thought, hmm. Not everybody does. Grudgingly, I must say. <laughs> okay, so questions. We have two microphones, I think, that are going around. Ooh, one. Who has a question? Yes, here. Ja, guten Abend. Die beiden Frauen von den Zürcher Medien haben schon einen Touch von Purismus, muss ich sagen. Im Gegensatz zu diesem wundervoll leidenschaftlichen Mann aus Belgien. <lacht> ähm, äh, etwas, das, etwas, das nicht angesprochen wurde, ist, dass natürlich der Tagesanzeige in einer ganz anderen Position ist als der belgische Journalist. Weil der Tagesanzeige kann die Leaks einfach nehmen und schweizerisch bearbeiten und auswerten. Das ist dann viel eher eine Leistung von Datenauswertung, spezifisch auf Journalismus. Aber der arme Belgier, der muss schauen, wie er über die Runden kommt. Weil we were, we were Leaks auswerten also. oder eine spannende Story ähm, irgendwie zusammenbekommen, das ist ein Unterschied. Also darf ich da etwas dazu sagen? Also der arme Belgier, das, das glaube ich, wir sind sicher in verschiedenen Situationen. Ich würde aber nicht sagen, I, I wouldn't say that you are a poor Belgian. And I just want to explain a, a little bit. Um, this sounds like really like a lot of fun having to work in, with a league, but I tell you, it's not. It's really hard work. And I don't say that to make you feel like poor journalists from Tamedia, but it is, not just for us, for everybody that participates in these <laughs> leagues. It's like months and months of super boring work with numbers, and you just hate it, I tell you, after three weeks. It's not fun. It's maybe fun at the end, after with 300 journalists worldwide, we find out something that we feel like, wow, we can really make a difference, like this Panama paper showing what happens in offshore countries. When we were able to dig out of these millions of documents, hundred millions of numbers, some stories that showed what's going on, and that we were able with that to change some laws in different countries, also in Switzerland, that made us happy, but I tell you, the work was a pain in the butt, nothing else. And just to, to clarify, Mo was part of ICIJ. We published Swiss Leaks, Lux Leaks, Panama Papers, Paradise Papers. <clears throat> and exactly. for, for us, it was, it was a, a big investment in time. I mean, we were part of this international uh, 
collaboration, but when you have a team of 5.2 full-time equivalent journalists, then putting one of those journalists for four or five months, and for the Panama Papers it was almost eight months, uh, to work on this one investigation, that's, that's super intensive, and it's a difficult uh, decision to make as an editor-in-chief, because you know you have to make up for that somehow, and in small organizations uh, that are not rich but not poor either, uh, it's the editor-in-chief that gets to make up for that. So it's, it was a difficult decision. Also, And it was painful. Sie waren auch dabei. Der arme Belgier war auch dabei. Just a, com just a comment there. Maybe one of the next things that's going to happen is that uh, we're going to start to see people sharing labor on the same stories across NGOs and journalistic organizations. I mean, I mean I'll tell you, the, the people at The Guardian told me, they said, wow, we put a huge team on, uh, on these stories. I said, really? What's a huge team? I said, four people. That's the level of capacity that's left in the industry after downsizing. In the best of places. In the best of places. Mehr Fragen? Ja, gerade hier. Ah, hier. Entschuldigung, zuerst. First, uh, an issue between investigative journalism and constructive journal journalism. And at the same time, it's also linked with bias. Because for me, the investigative journalism should bring on uh, on the floor all the facts as true as possible uh, uh, cont contacting as many sources as possible on the uh, with the aim of uh, bringing the facts on the floor and fighting against the uh, fact uh, uh, now the fake news uh, fake news which are getting more and more in vogue and therefore Uh, investigative journalism gets uh, again more uh, weight into the new uh, public media or mainstream media or uh, the st uh, stakeholder driven media. So you wanted to know the difference between... Uh, no, and the constructive uh, journalism, for me, they are more research oriented. They have an aim behind them to make a change or the even to give some recommendations to act on something. And uh, therefore, there is, they are more biased because they have an uh, ultimate goal behind compared to the investigative journalism for me. You know, I, I think you're saying something very important. My views on this are biased by what I went through when I was in my 20s, okay? My career began after Watergate. For about 10 years, I was part of a movement that denounced everything that was wrong in American society. And people grew to hate us. Because we kept painting a world that was unbelievably dark. And they finally got sick of us. And I thought, we can't do that again. You know, now, this is just me. And you are, you are saying something very profound, okay, which is that at the point where you stop talking about what is now or what has happened before and you project into the future, you leave the realm of the real and, it, and to some level you go into the realm of speculation. You are quite right and I understand that. And I also understand that it's a, that it's a great risk. But the risk of, of not trying to imagine something better is sometimes even greater. There's no perfect solution. We have to choose the danger we want to confront. There was this gentleman here. Haben Sie? Ja, danke. Also, ich bin, ich, ich rede von einem Standpunkt des Laien aus. Und ich habe eine Frage in Bezug auf die Fakten. Also, ich, so wie ich es verstanden habe, ist ja das eine Recherche, Recherche die Zuverlässigkeit von komplizierten Faktenlagen. Das ist also, wäre sozusagen wie der Boden. Und warum soll ein Journalist dann nicht, wenn er, wenn er es offenlegt, auch sich engagieren können also als, und das eben zeigen, dass er offen ist, aber auf dieser Faktenlage. Und meine äh, Zusatz, zusätzliche Frage ist eigentlich, ob es 
neben diesem Double Check, das wurde erwähnt, es wurde aber nie Triple, Quadruple, Quint <lacht> und so weiter Check gesagt. Ich denke, das, das ist doch alles sehr kompliziert. Gibt es da nicht auch äh, Entwicklungen, dass zum Beispiel im Bereich der, des Dat der Datenverarbeitung, äh, des Data Mining und weiß ich was, dass man eben auch auf, auf technischem, also sprich natürlich äh, computertechnischem, künstlicher Intelligenz etc. versucht, diesen Boden, den ich vorhin gemeint habe, zu, zu festigen. Sie meinen, um die Fakten zu verifizieren? Um, um einfach diese, den Boden der Fakten mal wirklich zuverlässig zu machen. Jetzt Katrin. In Englisch? Um, also was soll ich jetzt? Oder? Ja. Ja, Gern. in Englisch? Okay. Ist es um, gut für Sie in, in, auf Englisch? Yeah. Um, it's, to me, it's not so easy. You're right, there are some technical tools that we can use, and the data journalism helps us a lot. But it only to a certain extent, and it has been overestimated in the last years. And I think with the data journalism, or with treating big data, we can do a lot, but at the end, we have to use our minds and heads and intelligence and sources to find the real story. Because of what happened a lot in the last years is that data was used and it was just fun, we have data, great, we have data, let's make a story. And then they wrote something that was data driven, but it wasn't really a story that mattered to the people. And so I think the hard work is still, even if you have tools to, to search big data or, or whatever you can do with it, at the end of the day, you have, we have to find the story and we have to verify it. And that's a lot of work still. I mean, no computer, no complex program will uh, eliminate that. And I think that's actually good because journalism is a, is a human thing. It's us, us people that look at stories and, and or look for stories, I mm -hmm. would say. And if that's a machine doing it, then I'm out of it. Mm -hmm. More questions, maybe up there? Yeah, that open. Ähm, ich liebe investigativen Journalismus, also Sie. I love you as an investigative uh, journalist. Um, one point, you do a really important job. It's one important part of democracy. As a society, we need information we can build on. Um, ich sage es auf Deutsch. Es ist äh, eine akademische Frage, Konkurrenz oder Kollaboration. Für mich ist es viel wichtiger, dass Sie eine Position haben. Sie zeigen Missstände auf in Wirtschaft, Gesellschaft, Politik, wo immer es Ihnen wichtig scheint. Und für mich ist es viel wichtiger, dass Sie etwas bewirken. Und das Bewirken erfordert auch Kollaboration. Wenn Sie nicht mit Greenpeace zusammenarbeiten, dann ist das Risiko groß, dass gewisse Dinge einfach im Sande verlaufen. Als Bürger ist man allein gelassen, wenn man das zwar liest, aber nicht weiß, wo man sich engagieren kann, andocken. Das ist ein großes Thema und darum ist es mir lieber, es gibt Stakeholders, es gibt NGOs, die eine Position haben und sich dafür stark machen und ich kann da mich einklinken und helfen, was auch immer. Das ist einfach ein Statement. Eine Frage habe ich, was wäre, wenn alle Medien eine sogenannte Transparency Box nutzen würden? Das heißt Investigativer Journalismus gibt per se als Quality Standard immer auch ihre Quellen, soweit das möglich ist, bekannt, damit man unterscheiden kann zwischen Fake News und realen News. Katrin, die Frage an Sie. Eine Transparency Box, wo ganz offen und ganz transparent gemacht wird, wie man arbeitet, how you work, how, how, if ever that's possible. Yeah, I could imagine that we do that more. I mean, mm -hmm. I, we try when we have when we work on leaks, then we usually try to say as much as we can about how we got the information, how we treated it, 
um, how we worked, collaborated, with whom we collaborated. But I agree with you, the more we can show how we work, the more uh, believable we are. I, I totally agree. Um, and I do understand you need that you need uh, somebody that you could engage with um, on some topics that you feel like are important. For me, it would just be why, why can't we have both? Why can't we have the NGOs that you can go to and then on the other hand, you have investigative journalists that maybe they're stubborn, I don't know, but they just want to stay independent. Leave them or let them do that. I mean, wh why would that hurt each other? Why can't we just have both and and try to... to we, I, th I believe, I mean, journalism is really something, or investigative journalism, for me at least it is, and I know it's for my colleague, it's something that you have to be full time with, with everything you have, with every emotion and energy you have in your body, you have to go into it. So, and that's what NGOs do too. You know, we are very engaged. We want to we wanna work for a better world. I think this is probably the common ground we have, or at least that's what I think. And we do it different ways. And so what? Why can't we do it different ways? I mean, I don't think it bites it, each other. But what you said is um, what we actually do um, at Republique. We try to be as transparent as possible, um, but there are limitations um, when we work with sources that we cannot publish um, for legal reasons, um, to protect the source or to protect the sources. Um, so one cannot expect full transparency, but where we can be transparent, we'll do publish how we reported on it, and we do publish um, the actual, the original source. But I said, with within its limitations. Okay, let's make a point here. <coughs> we could discuss a lot more about those issues. Thank you so much. Guy, Silke, Mark, Catherine, Oliver. Thank you. I felt like Alice in Wonderland on the other side of the mirror. <laughs> I was biting my nails um, and felt personally addressed uh, at least half a dozen times. Thank you, Silke. Um, <laughs> full, transpar full transparency? No. <laughs> Anyhow, um, thank you so much, uh, Nicoletta, for that uh, very competent and charming Moderation, as usual, and thanks to that panel, that was just awesome. It was just as controversial as it could get. And uh, I'm not sure you know whether you'd rather, say, renew your media or Republic subscription or become a Public Eye member. I would advise do both. And there are others out there that need your support. All this radio. <laughs> That's the next panel right there. <laughs> um, I'll hand on this chocolate that comes from Chopa Chopa, and that will get some. That's the best and most sustainable stuff you get in Switzerland, Mark. Believe me. Um, you bring that home to your wife, right? <laughs> to be sure. Um, and Chopa Chopa gets some good press here in Belgium and uh, France and in, in Switzerland as well. So thank you very much for coming, um, having us here. Thank you very much, Cosmos being such a gentle gastgeber, and uh, have a good way home. Thank you.